All right, we are now live for another Dr. Sadler's philosophy pop-up. Uh, let me make sure the uh, sound stuff is is uh, all set up right. My son was on this computer over the weekend, and and there's always some things that wind up being a little wonky uh, when he uses things. Okay, there we go. So it looks like the volume's right. And I see looking over in the chat window, a great <laughs> reminder from Michael. Uh, you all know the drill. If you want to be confident, your question is addressed by Dr. Sadler. It's a good idea to submit it early here in the chat. So I'll, I'll come back to those questions. That is quite true. Uh, it's always better to put it earlier than later because they, they tend to um, pile up. So, I thought, you know, I hadn't gotten around because this is an extraordinarily busy month to coming up with a topic. And then actually I wound up with, with one uh, on, in an unfortunate way suggesting itself to me. Uh, we had to put down our, our dog Magnus this weekend. And uh, he's 14 years old, um, really wasn't living um, a life as as himself more than moments at a time. Um, I mean, there was still a lot of him, him left, but uh, it was, you could say, greatly impeded. And so that was a, a big, uh, tough thing over this Thanksgiving weekend for, for all of us, but especially for my wife. And as it also turned out for my, my son, uh, my wife raised him from a puppy. So They'd been together his entire life, and our other dog, just adjust that, um, has known him her entire life just about because she actually was a puppy who he picked out. Um, so it got me thinking. I, I've, I've got a book project that I've been working on um, really since another animal uh, had to be put down several years ago, and I'll tell you about that in just a minute. But I was also thinking about something that we'd call the paradox of care, something I'll, I'll be doing a bit of writing about in Erexus Dianoetike, my main blog, uh, probably over the course of this week. And I also was thinking, you know, a lot about the nature of our relationship with animals. So I thought I'd just go on for a little bit talking about that before uh, taking questions. Let me look at the first couple ones. Um, yeah, so um, the whole title is Dr. Sadler's Philosophy Pop-Up After Putting Down a Beloved Dog Magnus. Some people are saying, you know, sorry to hear that. And uh, yeah, it, he was a good dog. Um, so let me talk about the the paradox of care first. Um, and, and there may be, you know, another name for this out there somewhere in the philosophical literature. I haven't, you know, done sort of a, a survey of the available literature to find out if, you know, somebody else has already covered these discussions or anything along those lines yet, but I, I will be for this book project that I'm, I'm working on. What I have in mind by, by talking about the paradox of care is as you give better care, you wind up extending the life and the a lot of other values too, say mobility and, and the possibility of uh, interacting for, and we'll talk about it in terms of animals here, although this could apply to people too, you end up extending all of these things for the animal by giving really good care. And the more care that you give, it's not as if there's a direct one-to-one -one relationship, but the more care that you give, um, the better their outcomes are. And for an animal who's, you know, like at the midpoint of their life, um, that's really great. You know, you can think about like when you take a, an animal to, to the veterinarian, uh, you want really good care for them. Or, you know, if you have somebody watching your, your animal in a period of convalescence or when you're on a vacation or something, the better care they get, the better it is for them. But when you're close to the end of their life, you're because of the good care, that you're giving at that time, and perhaps even because of the good care that you gave prior to that, you're extending their lifetime beyond what it naturally would be. And then all sorts of other problems and predicaments can start to arise. And, and in animals, it's quite often in terms of organ failure, you know, like if you have a cat, um, 
you know, what the vets tell us is their organs are good for about 12 years. And then beyond that, it's kind of touch and go. And I think you can say the same thing about dogs, although, you know, with dogs, there's also the factor of size. Older dogs tend not to live as long. Smaller dogs live longer. I'm not exactly sure why. I'm sure it has something to do with organs and the stress on them. But the paradox is you're, you're giving care because you love the animal or you, you feel a sense of compassion or sympathy or whatever it happens to be. And you're doing something that is objectively a good thing. And it is a good thing. None, none of the, you know, the fact uh, that, that it, it may not pay off or uh, might, might extend their life in ways that make them suffer, none of that takes away from the goodness of the action or the intention or the motivation or character that it's coming from. But it can lead to outcomes that are, in some respect, tougher all around. And so precisely by doing what we feel to be the right thing and the good thing, we're then placed into a situation and the animal's placed into a situation where we eventually have to start making difficult decisions. And um, that's the paradox, right? Things don't turn out the way that we would expect that they, they do. Um, and so I'm going to do a bit more writing about that. And I, I thought I would just sort of throw that out there as, as an interesting feature of our moral life and our interaction with pets. And before I talk about, you know, all of our interactions with pets things, I just want to point out one thing, which is, you know, when you take on a puppy or a kitten or I don't know, whatever, you're going to have a tarantula, a, a snake, a ferret, for most animals, when you get it, <clears throat> you know, that animal is not going to live as long as you are. So, you know, if you treat it right, if you, it, unless there's some sort of accident, you're going to have to figure out what to do with it when it starts getting into its old age and starts getting sick and, and unhappy and suffering um, and loses mobility and perhaps, you know, has to be cleaned up after much more often or doesn't recognize you the way that it used to. Um, that's, that's part of what comes with being a, a, a good pet owner. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of ways in which people buy pets and then don't take care of them. When I lived in Southern Illinois, it was common to see college students who would buy a puppy or a kitten, and then they would abandon it quite, quite, you know, uh, frequently at the end of the semester as they went up to back to Chicago and left it down there. And it would just wander around, you know, looking for affection and food and eventually find a new person. That's how I actually got one of my cats. Um, the other thing that I was going to talk about um, with this was uh, the book project that I've been working on. So I should say a little bit about that, and then I'll, I'll jump into these questions and comments. So it was years ago, um, leading up until, you know, Christmas time, we had a, a cat who ultimately had liver failure, and, and we didn't know what was going on at the time. She started out by getting finicky about her food. She wasn't very old. Uh, she was she was on the older side, but she wasn't, you know, like 12, 13, you know, 13, 14, 15, 25, anything like that. Um, and so anyway, she stopped eating, and then we'd switch the food, and she'd eat a bit more of that. And then, you know, she'd stop eating that. And we were getting worried about her. So we eventually took her into the, the veterinarian's office, and they started doing tests on her. And it wasn't, you know, it was not pleasant for the cat to be boarded up and kept away from home and have pokes and prods and be lonely and all that. And eventually it, it came out that her liver was failing. And there really wasn't anything that we, we could do. And we had to make a very difficult decision because we'd gotten to the point where we'd already spent, you know, quite a lot of money um, to, to get these tests done and, and get, you know, some alleviation perhaps of what was going on, but nothing that could actually stem the tide. And the next step would be to send her up to Albany, uh, where she would be in like a special hospital. And uh, it was going to be about $500 a day. And there was no guarantee that any of this would, any of these, these drastic remedies would turn things around. And so, you know, we had to sit down and, and decide, um, okay, this is the time to euthanize her. And it, it, was, it was a tough decision. And seeing 
my wife going through this decision and the talking that we had and seeing that the the vets really you know they could they could give you a bit of advice but they weren't really that well equipped for that i thought you know i, I teach ethics for a living somebody should write a book about how to make these sorts of decisions and not like a textbook, right? Something that would be a handy guide for people as they're going through this decision-making process to make it, um, you know, to, to, to raise the sorts of questions that other people might be afraid to raise. Like, you know, um, maybe you should in fact have like a certain financial threshold where you're like, well, you know, Fluffy gets this much and beyond that we're not going – there and then you know should you feel guilty about that or should you say this is a prudent thing to do those are the sorts of things that we we don't have very good discussions about because we don't actually train people to do it and you know in 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 hospitals we do have medical ethicists in some hospitals usually that gets like pushed off to the unfortunate doctors who are definitely not equipped to handle it or to the um, chaplains who oftentimes are out of their depth as well um, but we don't have anything like this for veterinarians. And I've been talking, you know, with people in the veterinary industry from time to time when I, you know, do a little bit of progress on the book saying, do you think something like this would be helpful for you? Do you think something like this would be helpful for your clients? Um, and the, the, the response is always, yeah, this would be great. I mean, it wouldn't cover everything. Nothing can cover everything. But it would sure as hell be better than what's available, which right now, as far as I can tell, is almost nothing. So that's that's a project. I actually started outlining the book. Um, couple shut up and writes. You know, it's this writing thing that we host here in Milwaukee. A couple shut up and write sessions ago. I devoted a time just to putting together an outline, and I'm going to start working on the book. Um, you know, I was spending quite a bit of time doing caretaking of one sort or another with Magnus. Um, so I can take that time instead and work on that book. And I think it would be, you know, a good project. I've got other writing things I have to be working on as well, as well as, you know, shooting videos and things like that. But I, I think this would be a, you know, a real labor of love in some respects. And, um, you know, as an ethicist, uh, I think this is a good project to take on for me. So I'm curious to see what people think about that. Maybe I'm going to address a few questions and comments, and then um, maybe if if we have a lull, I'll talk about, you know, sort of my reflections on human beings and our relations with animals. If not, um, we'll just go with the questions. So Christopher, just wanted to say thank you for the content. My formal education has been in biology, but I'm self-studying philosophy now on my own as it helps paint a clear picture of what I know scientifically. Well, that's really great to, to read. Yeah, um, somebody you probably would enjoy reading that if you don't already know about him is, is uh, one of my colleagues, Massimo Pigliucci, who um, first earned you know, his, his degree in one of the natural sciences, in biology, I believe, his PhD, and then eventually went on and earned another degree in philosophy. And he, he wrote quite a few things about biology at first. Um, and, and yeah, the philosophy, when it's done well, that's the key thing there, right? When it's done well, when it's not a dilettante game, when it's not, you know, people having academic trip wars or, or, you know, doing their tiny little project uh, that has nothing to do with anybody else's project. When it's doing its job well, it should actually provide um, some sort of context for the sciences that, that helps them understand what they're doing. Um, not a lot of money in that game, unfortunately. So not too many people do it. Uh, let's see what else we got going on here. Um, people are saying hello. All right, looks like we got a lot of uh, questions that just sort of jumped all over the place. Uh, well, here's a question that I can't actually answer much of. What are the implications of general relativity for Kant's transcendental idealism? It seems if by space and time can be modified by phenomena, they themselves are phenomenal and not transcendental. I mean, they could still be transcendental, just a transcendental in a different way than they are uh, for, for Kant. Um, they, you know, they're definitely not, space and time are definitely not the same thing as the things that fill space and time, I would say. But it's not something that I do a lot of work on. 
Made of Clay, how do you feel about Paul Tillich? Um, well, Tillich is a kind of funny guy for a couple of reasons. So Tillich was really big stuff when I was an undergraduate, but that was in part because my undergraduate professors were so far behind the times um, that they thought that existentialism was, you know, the end of continental philosophy. And Tillich is okay. The Courage to Be is not a bad book. Um, I think that as far as existentialist thinkers go, he's not a really profound one, um, but he's not terrible. Um, I'll tell you another thing that was, you know, kind of funny about him. They, they found that he, he had a, a, quite a, a stash of erotic images after he died, and people were very surprised about that. Uh, per Obbaizazione. Thoughts on Zoroastrianism and its influence on Judaism and Christianity. Um, yeah, I, I used to teach about Zoroastrianism when I taught world religion classes. And so I had to do, you know, as I do with any class that I teach where I'm not already well versed in it, I had to do a lot of research on, on the topic. And I was surprised to find out just how much influence Zoroastrianism had exerted on later Judaism and then thereby on Christianity. And so how did that influence happen? Well, remember, the per Zoroastrianism is, is associated with, with uh, Persia. And when, um, you know, you had the separated kingdom in, in, in you know, Israel to the north and then Judea with the two tribes in the south and the Assyrians come in and destroy the kingdom of Israel and start, you know, transplanting people there and there. Uh, and then the Babylonians and the, you know, they, they defeat the, the Assyrians. And then you have the Babylonian captivity, right? Which means that the Babylonians, this is very common in ancient times. If, if you wanted to make sure that a people stayed conquered, you could do um, a couple different things. One was just bring in a whole bunch of other people, like what happened in, in you know, the northern part of the, the kingdom, where um, all these other people were brought in and you know, sort of intermixed with the Israelites, and th that's how you got the uh, Samaritans. Um, who then were considered unclean and, and you know, uh, not, not real Jews and heretical and all these other things by, from the people in the South. Um, that was from the Assyrians. The Babylonians did something different. They were like, well, let's just take all the elites, you know, and we'll transport them to Babylon. And then everybody who's left on the land will just keep their mouths shut and not give us any problems. So, so they did that. And then the Persians conquered the Babylonians, Persians and Medes, right? And then the Persians under their, their first main empire, uh, brought all those Jewish exiles back and allowed the, the you know, people of Jerusalem to rebuild their walls. For this, Cyrus was called the anointed of the Lord. The only Gentile, as far as I know, who gets called the anointed of the Lord in uh, those, those older documents that we call the Old Testament or the, you know, the Hebrew scriptures. And um, because of that, Zoroastrianism, exerts a significant um, influence on, you know, Jewish religion and, and thoughts about things. So like the idea of hell being a fiery place comes from Zoroastrianism. Zoroastrianism had a savior figure called the Saushant. Um, now they had a different, you know, understanding of how it would work, but, um, you know, there's a lot of different aspects of it that uh, make their way in. And I, I think that's kind of cool. Um, like Judaism and Christianity, it really stresses a uh, ethical code. Um, there is arguably a monotheistic uh, core to Zoroastrianism. Sometimes people want to say dualism, but really that's sort of a, um, I would say, sort of a um, what Zoroastrianism sometimes became rather than the, the core of it. Um, so, yeah, very, very interesting stuff. I actually... Um, had a professor who was a Zoroastrianism, Zoroastrian when I was in college. And uh, so I was fortunate and able to getting to talk with him about contemporary Zoroastrianism. That was Maravon Kodavandi, who retired last year. I met him again when I was up at Lakeland uh, about a year and a half ago. And he was, you know, on his way out because he was older. So, all right. Um, let's see here. Kevin Costner, my dog passed away a couple months ago. It was the most difficult tragedy to put, push through. Sorry for your loss. 
yeah, that's it is it is a tough thing um, dealing with the the death of a, a pet, um, and uh, it's it, in some ways it's tougher when you have to make the decision yourself, you know, or as, as a group about um, ending the, the pet's life as opposed to an accident happening, right? An accident happening, that sucks. That's terrible. But when you have to be involved with it, then there's all these other issues that, that come about, right? Um, let's see, what do we got here? More and more questions. Um, a lot of stuff about other dogs who've died. All right, so Joachim, some people suggest owning dog, owning pets as property is in some way equivalent to slavery. Obviously, this analogy seems overblown, although there seem to be some similarities. Any thoughts? Well, um, the way some people treat their animals is certainly like, you know, slavery, right? And, and, and we could think of, I think it's really helpful to think of this using ancient um, philosophy, Particularly, you know, think about Aristotle, who he gets a lot of heat for, uh, you know, talking about there being some people slaves by nature. He doesn't actually think most most slaves are slaves by nature. He thinks they're slaves by convention. And he talks about technology, and he says that were it possible for the loom to weave itself, we wouldn't need any of these end sold tools that we call slaves, and that's exactly what technology does, and we're posed with some of the same questions. Now, a lot of people treat animals as if they're technology, as if they don't have feelings, as if they don't have any, um, you know, you could say likenesses to us uh, in, in things that count. And maybe some of them don't have very much of that. Maybe, you know, if we go down the order of things, Maybe we don't have to be that concerned about insects. Although, you know, the more we observe animal behavior, the more we start to see maybe there are some things that, that maybe there are attachments, maybe there are feelings that we weren't taking it, uh, for, you know, into account. As we start moving up into birds and mammals, man, it, it, there are a lot of people treating animals as if they're just dumb, brute machines who are in effect treating them as if they are, you know, merely, merely slaves, um, you know, subject solely to our whims, only important because of that. And uh, I think we're, we're starting to realize at least some of us that that's, that's, that's wrong headed. Doesn't mean that we have to say they're totally equal to us. Um, you know, I, I think when you try to say, oh, I'm getting rid of speciesism altogether, man, that just turns into a massive quagmire. It becomes almost impossible to make any decision then. But, um, yeah, that's that's a good point. All right, Kanag LV. The book sounds interesting, and on the topic of writing, do you have any advice on how to outline books or get started in writing? Um, well, the best way to get started in writing is, is start writing, right? Because you're going to write a lot of stuff. And when you first start writing, a lot of the stuff that you write isn't very good, but that's how you get better. You also need to read a lot, too. And have other people review your writing and go through the, the difficult process of them saying, this sucks, and here's why it sucks, and here, here's how you can make it better, and you will become a better writer. So part of the process of, of becoming a better writer is learning how to deal with a lot of rejection in productive ways. Um, and then, you know, how to outline things. You know, I, I like just what is each chapter supposed to be doing? And do the, does the order of the chapters make sense? There's no right length for, for books. You know, it totally depends on the topic and the audience and what the book is intended to achieve, all of those sorts of things. Um, you know, some books are very short and very good. Other books are quite lengthy and, and need to be quite lengthy, you know. Um, we live in a wonderful time, too, because... In the past, you were basically stuck either with self-publishing, which was seen as a luxury vanity thing, and you paid a lot of money for it, or with having to pitch your stuff to an academic press or to trade, you know, presses. And there you were stuck with whatever they wanted to do, you know. Um, now, the, the opprobrium about self-publishing has gone away. And if you want to, you know, try to produce a book that's 800 pages, go ahead, you know. Uh, nobody's going to stop you. 
you know, it may not sell as well as shorter books, but you, you can do it. So we live in a really great time for that. Um, Phantom Upload is a very generic question. What is power? I don't know. There's a lot of definitions out there. The capacity maybe to produce effects, to get things done. Uh, 2046, best Stoic texts that deal with the topic of death. Well, I mean, there's a lot of discussions in Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius that are that are particularly germane, and in Seneca, particularly in his letters. But Seneca also has um, letters of consolation to particular people. Those are the ones I would look at. Um, all right. Uh, Adam, what to do if you're interested in so many things and you can't choose anything to be an expert in? Um, well, keep cracking at those and maybe one of them, you know, right now isn't suggesting itself to you, but as you reach a higher level of expertise, maybe that will draw you in. Uh, there's a question uh, about crime and punishment. Why does Aliona the pawnbroker call Rosh, uh, Rosh Alonikov father? I, I don't know. I haven't read the book for, for quite a while. Um, I'm not sure why people <laughs> ask questions like that here. All right, uh, Kevin, I find it strange we ethically weigh the correct decision for euthanizing pets who are ill by referring to the probability of recovery time and affordability to the owner. That seems immoral. Well, that doesn't seem immoral to me at all. Um, most decisions that we make in life, we have to weigh a number of different incommensurable goods against each other. That's what makes them difficult decisions. Um, it, you know, when we have the luxury of having easy ethical decisions, that's that's wonderful, but that's pretty rare. Most of the important decisions, we have to weigh things like that against each other. And so the question is not to like to strip all those away and say they're immoral. The question is to try to get those decisions right, or at least more right. Made of clay, why is anti-Semitism still a thing? Another very big question. Um, well, you know, I would say we're always going to have people who, who uh, want to find somebody else to blame about things, and we're always going to have sort of, uh, what would you call it, you know, stupid uh, prejudices around because there's always going to be somebody repeating them, you know. Um, why is racism still a thing in general? I mean, by this point in time, we should be beyond that, and there's going to be somebody who's going to go, well, oh, races are natural or some, some other, you know, basically warmed over 19th century racism, Gobineau style thing. Uh, and, and there's your answer. People like to have these sorts of things to, to um, motivate them. Um, I can tell you this, that if you've actually got something productive to do with your life, you're not going to be an anti-Semite or a racist or, you know, uh, discriminating against other people because you're going to be too busy, like trying to do good things to to you know screw around with stuff like that. Uh, Seven twenty six uh, Twister, are you an antinatalist? What do you think about it? I'm not an antinatalist. Um, I think you know an antinatalist is somebody who thinks that we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't have any more uh, children born, and it's a bad thing to be born, and all that. And um, I mean, I would say we should try to improve the conditions for the children stuck in this in this world that we managed to bollocks up pretty pretty good. Um, but I, I'm definitely not an antinatalist. I certainly made my contribution to continuing the species. I have two kids myself. So Kevin Costner, are you a moral realist? I, I don't, when people usually ask me, are you an ist? My, the answer is usually no, um, because these are things that can mean whatever you want. There's usually like a lot of ambiguity in, in these terms. But if you mean by moral realist that I think that there are actual objective standards of value out there that are independent of um, discourse or things like that, sure. But that doesn't mean that I, I, I don't think that um, language doesn't matter or culture doesn't matter or anything like that. So it depends on what kind of more moral realist you're talking about. Floyd Fanatic, are you familiar with what's called depressive realism in psychology? What, if any, are the, its philosophical implications, epistemologically, metaphysically, or ethically? I haven't heard that word, but I may have come across that concept because a lot of things in psychology um, wind up being the same old stuff repackaged and called something different. Same thing, by the way, for business theory, ed theory. Lots of stuff is just the same thing. 
So, yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm going to skip over the Noam Chomsky because I've, I've talked about that many times before. Ways to overcome skepticism from Adam Titor. Well, there aren't really ways to overcome skepticism. There isn't like a, you know, uh, argument that you could give that like is going to convince the skeptic. Um, a lot of those sort of things I think are matters of putting together a whole bunch of different experiences and reflecting on them. And, and, and maybe there's times where a person goes through a skeptical phase um, and, and that can be okay so long as you're not doing things like saying, I don't know if I walk off this cliff if I will uh, not fall down. You know, if, if you do, then like Pyro, uh, the skeptic, you, you really need some followers to keep you from going off the cliff. Uh, Joe Brammer, my condolences about Magnus. Is YouTube more conducive of producing right-wing thinkers such as Jordan Peterson or merely reflective of the user base or is there a symbiosis going on? Well, um, YouTube didn't produce Jordan Peterson. Jordan Pre Peterson became what he is, and then he, you know, wound his wound up being on YouTube, and people watched him and liked what he had to say, and you know, shared it. and And actually, too, you got to remember that a lot of uh, things that promote things, promote people or, or causes, are people posting and saying, "This is terrible," right? So there's probably a good bit of that with the Peterson as well. Um, I wouldn't say that YouTube strikes me as being any more left-wing than right-wing as, as a format because there's many YouTubers out there on all these different wings and all other parts of the spectrum as well. Um, I will say this, that, that I don't think Peterson could have made it big without YouTube. Um, he would have just been another you know, obscure academic engaging in the kinds of, you know, uh, speculative discussions that plenty of our professors did saying a lot of the same stuff. Um, but he put his stuff on YouTube and it caught on and people were like, this is really great. Got to watch this. And, and then other people started taking notice of him. But what really catapulted him to fame is stuff outside of YouTube, right? Um, being put into other media and, and being part of protests. Daniel Cox, what are some of your favorite books on the philosophy of religion? I, you know, I, I like classic stuff. Uh, William James's Varieties of Religious Experience. I, when I teach philosophy of religion, I have people read that. Um, Rudolf Otto's The Phenomenon of the Holy is pretty cool. Um, you know, uh, Gabriel Marcel arguably fits in there. Josiah Royce. Um, you know, um, usually I'm I'm doing stuff not that so much books on philosophy of religion and, and more, you know, looking at the figures and their arguments or, or uh, schemes, you could say. Um, so like Anselm, right? Do a lot of work on him. He's definitely an important person in the philosophy of religion, by the way, not just for the so-called ontological argument, but for a whole bunch of other reasons as well. But he's not like writing philosophy of religion because that whole field didn't come into existence until uh, essentially the 19th century. Um, all right, let's see what else we got here. Um, made of clay, why do people see cultural Marxism as out to get us? Um, I guess there's sort of a complicated answer to that. So there's cultural Marxism in the sense that the people criticizing cultural Marxism intend it some of the time when they're being, you know, not they're not engaging in flights of fancy or just emotional language, but they're talking about people who, you know, um, wanted to try to take over the academy and steer it in a more uh, leftist manner, which is not really a Marxist manner if you're actually being technically accurate about what Marxism uh, is about, but um, in a broad leftist manner, right? And there are a lot, a lot of leftists in academia, and, and there, a lot of them think that academia, and they're totally wrong about this. I mean, it's funny, because see the people outside of academia, um, and they get all, they get, you know, all worked up about how the academics are teaching this and that. They've never stepped into a college classroom and seen a bunch of like kids not paying attention to the teacher, especially if the teacher seems out of touch to them. The danger of, you know, academic cultural Marxism indoctrinating our students, man, you know, there's a, there's a few places where that happens, 
but that's so far removed from the reality of universities and colleges that the people who are talking about it just ought to shut up and go and spend some time in actual classrooms and pay attention without going in with their own ideological blinders and they, they feel a lot less fearful, right? So there's all that, right? Uh, and, and there are plenty of, of academics who are on the left, closed-minded, shut conversation down, you know, means justify the end sort of, sort of people. Um, and then there's this broader critique of cultural Marxism that's basically fine-spun bullshit, you know, um, where, where it's essentially an emotional term that people are using without knowing very much about Marxism itself, or sometimes they'll lump postmodernism in there too. And... Um, Again, they're creating a boogeyman that they can use to scare people and, and justify being scared themselves. So, all right, uh, the Floyd fanatic, any thoughts on Umberto Eco's concept of ur-fascism? I would say it's wrong in calling itself ur-fascism because that implies that like he's gotten at the root of it. There are a lot of great discussions about what goes into what we call the fascist minimum, right? You know what I call everybody fascist. Uh, who we disagree with or who have power or something like that. You know, we need to recognize the difference between, say, a military dictatorship and actual fascist regimes, you know, where you've got mobilization of the masses, uh, you know, an attempt to overcome class divisions, all, all those, those sorts of uh, aspects to it. Um, a lot of conservative regimes are not fascist. Um, Echo's essay is good. I actually I use it when I talk about uh, fascism. I would not rely on it as the sole um, uh, set of criteria for it. Adam asks, are you good at chess? I am not good at chess. As a matter of fact, I played some games with my 11-year-old son, and uh, I, I beat him and won and uh, <laughs> lost two, and we actually had a draw because I wasn't paying attention uh, to where I was putting my pieces and put him into a stalemate <laughs> position by mistake. So, yeah. All right. Um, 21st century dub, back to animal stuff. I had a puppy get hit by a car a few years ago, died in the street. I had to get a towel and pick her up off the street and bury her myself, tough for sure. Yeah, especially when it's a puppy, you know. Um, and we say something similar, I think, too, about, about human beings, you know. When, when somebody who's quite old and sick dies, you know, sometimes sometimes we're very sad about it. By the way, Lauren, if you don't, yeah, uh, a lot a lot of recent deaths of, of of important people in in the news lately. But so we we get very upset uh, when a young person dies because we're like, oh, they had their whole life ahead of them. They were in their prime. Things were going good for them. Um, yeah, I, I actually had a dog when I was a kid. I'll tell you a little story. I won't make it too long. Um, I had a dog named Lady, and uh, when she was probably four or five years old, she got hit by a car um, right by our, our house. And she was a black dog, and, you know, we lived uh, in, an, in an unlit area, so it's, you know, no, no harm, no fault. But, and the person who hit her actually like, came to the house immediately and said, you know, we hit your dog. And, and she ran about 100 yards on a broken hip uh, and then collapsed. And so, you know, my, my dad... Um, went and got his car and um, got a hold of the vet. And then I, he sent me out with a blanket to, to stay with her and keep her warm. Um, and then um, he and a couple of the other guys from the neighborhood um, put the blanket under her and got her into the car and took her to the vet. And then at the vets, um, he gave us a, a choice to make. He said, listen, we can have Christmas or we can replace lady's hip. If we're not replacing her hip, then we're going to put her to sleep. So you decide, and we decided not to have Christmas. Um, we ended up having Christmas anyway. I, I don't know, you know, something must have happened. But it was, you know, a pretty expensive operation at the time. And when she came back, you know, her hip was shaved. She had this plastic uh, implant, and she didn't want to eat, and it took a long time to, to coax her and get her back to going again. Um, but, yeah. All right. Um, 
Hukamer makes a, a point. It's weird having to clean up my slaves' poop and vomit. You know, it's kind of funny. In ancient times, if you actually read literature about um, slaves or servants or stuff, people often think, oh, you get to boss them around, do whatever you want. I mean, read Epictetus, who, by the way, was a slave uh, and then had a servant himself later, uh, you know, at one point, and, 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 and see what he has to say about just the hassles associated <laughs> with uh, managing other people. Uh, Joe Hausman, what's your general opinion on the utility of psychoanalysis in aiding our understanding of philosophical or ethical issues? Um, well, my general opinion is that psychoanalysis can be helpful with some things, but it's always works better when it's not, you know, used as a sole approach, but as an adjunct to other things. I think there's a lot of nutty psychoanalysts out there. I think there's a lot of people who don't know psychoanalytic theory well particularly with Lacan, and then try to, you know, push it into cultural theory and just blather a bunch of nonsense, you know. Uh, film theory is full of that sort of stuff uh, and has been for, for several generations. Um, I don't think that we should throw psychoanalysis out altogether. Um, I think things like, you know, the Oedipus complex, we could probably get rid of that at this point. Um, but, you know, there's a lot, of, a lot of useful insights, and I think sometimes – some of the things that psychoanalysis does and depth psychology in general does can be useful in getting, um, getting people to, to uh, work through traumas that, say, CBT can't get to, you know. Um, and so it could be, you know, useful in, in some respects. Uh, Catholicismo and Ecclesia Militans thought of postmortem repentance in Christianity as possible. I don't have any opinion on that sort of thing, you know. Um, Memento Mori, what's your thoughts on free will and moral responsibility? I think we have free will. I don't think it's what many of the opponents of free will uh, think free will is. I think it's probably a lot more limited. Uh, and I think it's actually something that we can expand through intentional ways of living. And I think philosophies as a way of life are, are ways of doing that. That's one of the things that attracts me to Stoicism. Adam, you don't usually talk about analytic philosophy. Why do you prefer continentalists? Well, I don't prefer continentalists or continentals. Um, I, I'm actually a historian of philosophy. If you look through my channel, you're going to find way more stuff on ancient philosophy than you are on, on any contemporary continental stuff. And, you know, I, I do, in fact, like some analytic philosophers. Um, John Wisdom I've talked about many times. I, I enjoy, you know, I started writing my master's thesis on Wittgenstein. The only reason I didn't finish it is I, I couldn't get my advisor to actually understand what I was, what I was trying to do. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I like quite a few analytic philosophy uh, things and I sometimes teach a bit of that and I'm not, you know, uh, a fan of many continental <laughs> philosophers. Um, I often joke and maybe I will someday do it. I, I want to write a book someday that has chapters like, what in so-and-so is bullshit and what's actually good, you know, and do that for all these, these continental figures. Um, but, I mean, on the whole, the problems with, with contemporary analytics is they don't read very much. Um, the ones that do quit being analytics pretty, pretty quickly. They, they wind up doing other things. You know, and they, they're trained in how to, you know, examine arguments and how to uh, create accounts of things, but they're not getting trained in, in much of anything else. And they, they wind up being very insular and provincial. And I, I don't like that in any field. I, I mean, what good is that? So, uh, I mean, continentals are, you know, very prone to all sorts of pros that doesn't actually mean anything and you're taking it apart. Um, and that's a problem too, you know. Uh, but analytics are the ones who more or less run the, the show. Um Catholicismo, uh, your thoughts on Jordan Peterson's act as if God would exist. That sounds sort of like Pascal's wager or, or James's will to believe. I, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I don't go to Peterson for theology or anything like that. Uh, Memento Mori had a follow-up. And if you're a compatibilist, do you think unfree action is impossible in the human view of reason, which is opposed to Plato's has no evaluative power that is, are different shades of the self needed for compatibilist moral responsibility? Yeah, I, I, you know, I am pretty much a compatibilist um, when it comes to uh, the metaphysics of, of the will. Um, I don't accept a human view of reason, though. I think reason can actually do a lot more than 
I think reason not only can do a lot more than Hume made room for, I think Hume himself uses reason to do a lot more than that. So he was, he was, in, he was uh, uh, inconsistent. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, theology of the body is another one. I, I'm going to have to move on to other people because there's so many questions. Uh, theology of the body by John Paul II. What are your thoughts? I haven't read it for over a decade. Um, I, I, I was never, you know, the, the stuff that I was always interested in by John Paul was before he became John Paul and was Carol Votia and wrote like the acting person or the, the encyclicals that he wrote that I think are good. Nathan, uh, have you read any Mach Sterner? If so, what's your take on his work? I have read Mach Sterner, yeah. I, and, and I've actually, um, I haven't taught him, but I've, I've uh, uh, been commissioned to do tutorials on him by people that are into Sterner. Um, interesting guy. Uh, he's got, got a, a very uh, interesting take on, um, you know, sort of historical progression. Um, I think that what he's doing and what Nietzsche are doing are similar in some respects. Um, when I'm, when I'm discussing egoism, sometimes if I have a, you know, sophisticated enough class, I'll, I'll bring him up as, as an example. And he's like totally consistent with his, his egoism, I would say. Um, all right, let's go on. Uh, chin lock lead is culture get in the way of equality. Some cultures are, you know, about equality. So I don't know why culture would necessarily get in the way of equality. Um, but it depends on, so it depends on what you mean by culture. If you mean like having a high culture that requires a lot of, uh, uh, people to spend, you know, their time resources to build something up. Yeah, maybe. Um, but it depends on what kind of kind of question. Uh, so Daniel Cox is complaining here. I open up and ask a question specifically about losing a dog and you ignore it. What a joke. Uh, I'm not sure I, I skipped a question. I certainly answered his question about, uh, uh, oh, here it is. Yeah. I mean, man, you know, it, it, email me about that sort of stuff. You know, this is not the place to like get petty and pissy with me. Um, okay. So you had to put your childhood dog down last month. It's the first time you cried in years. How, how have you personally dealt with the emotional response to such a traumatic event? Well, I've buried a lot of people and a lot of animals, uh, you know, and I started doing that when I was before my teens. So, I don't think our experiences are going to be all that uh, commensurate. Um, you deal with death, you know. It gets easier, I, I think, as as you get older and you deal with more of it. But it's never easy. You just learn to deal with it, you know. Um, yeah, crying is fine. I mean. <laughs> There was, I remember there was this book when I was a kid my dad had called Big Guys Don't Cry, right? And that was very much the ethos of the 70s and 80s. And it was so liberating for me reading the Odyssey, seeing that Odysseus, who you know I considered a real tough guy, um, and his crewmates cried over their crewmates as they're rowing back on their way, not knowing if they'll ever make it home. Um, so nothing wrong with, with crying, but, you know, uh, I don't think anybody realizes just how many of these questions I get and how easy it is to scroll past them. So, all right, uh, let's take the next one. Um, Marco Kirilov, can we get to the real morality in moral realism through language? Um, well, you're not going to get to it any other way. You're never going to be able to de you're never going to be able to put language entirely aside, it is our primary tool and it's how we communicate with each other. Um, so I, I don't see any other prospects for it unless you're thinking you're going to rely on some sort of like intuition or some sort of programming. Made of clay, what are your thoughts on religious fundamentalism? So there's fundamentalism in the strict sense, which was a particular movement within Protestant Christianity, largely here in America, differentiating itself from Pentecostals and evangelicals and other people who are biblical literalists. And then there's fundamentalism, sort of lowercase f, where generally people are talking about anybody who takes a, a religious text literally. 
And I would say, um, you know, we're, we're seeing sort of a resurgence in, in some religions of a kind of fundamentalist attitude, but nobody is a truly a fundamentalist. Nobody ever takes any religious text entirely, literally, because it would be impossible to do so. There's, there's too many places where there's ambiguities or verses you can't totally reconcile with each other. So it's always selective to some degree. Um, and, uh, you know, the question is, can then you provide some basis for what you're selecting? I will say this. A long time ago, I actually read the tracts that the original fundamentalists, capital F fundamentalists, uh, wrote called The Fundamentals. And although I didn't agree with them, I could recognize that they were some pretty interesting biblical scholars. They, these were not dummies, some backwoods people just, you know, th as we say, thumping a Bible. Um, they, they were, you know, college educated, and, and they thought that the way the modernist readings were going was, was off base. All right, Chip, have you read Blindsight by Peter Watts? I have not, so I can't really say much about that. Um, Marco, I'm having trouble doing a logic course. Do you have a program for that, like teaching historically? Frege, Russell, Wittgenstein, Carnap, or is it better to tackle the questions, paradoxes? I don't know. Um, it depends on your logic course. There's a lot of different ways logic is taught. Sounds like from what you're looking at, maybe they're going into the history of logic. I, I don't know, in which case you'd want to read Mill as well um, before Frege and Russell. But... Um, do I have a program for it? No, I, I don't have. I don't have a course for for logic. Um, be something fun to get to eventually if I ever do. Uh, but you know, I, I don't have anything for that. It's something I've taught a number of times, and and actually at one time I was kind of specializing in it when I was an undergraduate and early in graduate school. Um, but there's there's no one way that you have to study logic. I, I will say that. Um, if you want to like, you know, look at sort of the, the meta logic behind the logic, get Copy. He has some good books, not just the textbook, but he wrote some books on like, you know, sort of the, the, the how logic was working behind its own. See, I'm not expressing it well, but I mean, I read this when I was, when I was uh, an undergraduate, but it really impressed the hell out of me. He had a book and it was really good. He was, you know, like, where do truth tables come from and all of that sort of stuff. Yeah. All right. Uh, Nikki Tay, your mic needs adjusted when you move, it cuts out. Uh, well, it is what it is. I don't know what to tell you. Um, I'm going to ignore phantom uploads. Would you rather? I, I, I have a son who asks me those. I don't do those. All right, here we go. Shane Isbell, how would movements like critical race theory, which specifically avoid rationality, be viewed in the context of Hegel's dialectic? Would it be external to the dialectic or still part of it? Um, I mean, you're asking the question, can you shoehorn it into Hegel's dialectic? And I imagine you mean the dialectic of the phenomenology rather than the science of logic, right? or the encyclopedia logic. Um, I don't know that that critical race theory as a whole specifically avoids rationality. Uh, it's often critical of Western rationality, but it employs a rationality of its own. Um, I don't know. I mean, you could probably shoehorn it in one part or another of, of the phenomenology, but you, you, I wouldn't try to shoehorn an entire movement. I would say this person, this, this text, this thing fits in there, right? Um, I don't know. So in the beginning, he asks about Blood Meridian. Uh, I haven't read it, so I, I, don't, I don't know enough about it. David, do you have a video that goes further into your views on free will? Probably not. I have a lot of videos on other people's views on free will because that's more or less what I do is present other people's ideas. Um, so, you know, maybe I'll do my, my own later on. Um, yeah, so 21st Century Dub, never heard of John Wisdom, what a great name for a philosopher. Yeah, some of us luck out <laughs> in getting great names, right? Uh, he, he certainly did. Marco Kirillov, do you have opinions on speculative realism? No, not really. Um, I've interacted with Graham Harmon, um, but the rest, you know, I haven't read his stuff and, and uh 
I, uh, I haven't read the other people involved and it sounds interesting, but it's not something I have a lot of time for, for engaging in. Ah, here's a, here's a good historical question from Chip. Is Valeus and Cicero's Nature of the Gods a fair representation of Epicureans or is he something of a straw man? Tough to tell, right? Because we don't have a lot of representations of Epicureans by Epicureans. What we have is a bit of Epi Epicurus. We have, um, and that we only have because Diogenes Laertes wrote this stuff down line by line, thank God. And we have a bit, uh, well, we have, uh, you know, Lucretius. Uh, and so Lucretius is giving us some, some good stuff. Um, and then who else do we have? You know, Philodemus. Unfortunately, a lot of the stuff that we found, they managed to screw up those scrolls. Uh, and then almost everything is coming from people who are critical of the Epicureans. Um, I will say this. I think that Cicero treats the Epicureans unfairly in works like On the Ends. But On the Nature of the Gods, I think that's probably an accurate representation of Epicurean, you know, views on, on religion. Um, all right. Let's see. Uh, intellectual dark web. Some say we couldn't really think without language. That's probably right. <laughs> you know? uh, somebody who would, who would uh, be a proponent of that, by the way, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. Um, so that's an idea that's been around for a while. Jason, do you still teach at prisons? I haven't, I have not taught at a prison since I taught at Samson Correctional Institute in North Carolina. And that was in 2009. So it's almost 10 years since I've taught in prisons. And one reason for that is because prison education around the nation has been in decline. When I was teaching in Indiana, at Indiana State Prison for Ball State, Indiana was the nation's leader in prison education. Um, in a matter of years, they phased out all the, the, the BA, liberal arts education, replaced it with business education, which then they phased out. They may still have an Ivy Tech uh, in the prisons, but there's no like real serious prison education there anymore. And it's, it's unfortunate, you know. Um, all right. Made of clay. Have you read any Catherine, Catherine Malibu thoughts? Um, yeah, I read a little bit, not, not that much. Um, she actually, uh, teaches at European graduate school where, uh, my, my wife, uh, attended and, um, you know, they've, they've had some great conversations, but I haven't had the time to get to most of her, her stuff, unfortunately. Uh, seems pretty interesting. Oh, here is a tough question from Jake. How do you give some, someone the desire to self-actualize? Well, you don't. Um, that's not to say that you can't like keep throwing stuff out there, but there's no button you can push. There's nothing that you can do that will make a person want to self-actualize or improve themselves or live an intentional lifestyle or anything else that you might say along those lines. Uh, it's unfortunate in a sense, right? But it's also good because, you know, maybe some of these things have to be people's own decisions. You know, I mean, I, I'm sort of a good example of that. Um, I, I'm somebody who is quite a screw up, you know, um, good portion of, of my own young life. And uh, many of the things that people directed me towards or you know, good advice they gave me, I totally ignored because I wasn't ready to hear it at the time. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, well, just skipped again. There we go. Bell, my condolences. Losing a pet is never easy. Have you read Donna Haraway's The Companion Species Manifesto? No, I, I, I need, that's probably something I need to read. Interesting. Dogs, people, and significant otherness. Um, I, I know her more because of, you know, her notoriety over saying we're all cyborgs and her, her moment of, of uh, fame over that back when I was in graduate school, uh, sort of getting out, if I remember right. Um, 
that would probably be worth checking out on, uh, for me. So thanks for that that recommendation. Uh, all right, so we're at almost six o'clock, and I, I have to do a ton of grading, unfortunately, which is the worst part about teaching, <laughs> but absolutely important to do and absolutely important to to take seriously. So I'm going to look for somebody who I haven't answered a question from and, and something that I can actually um, answer fairly quickly. Um, well, here's a good one. This is something I've actually talked about with one of my clients who I, I meet with weekly. Um, who is more correct about human nature in your opinion, Rousseau or Hobbes, or is the whole enterprise, that's the part, of trying to define human nature absurd since there are so many individual variables? So let me answer the second part uh, before I talk you know, specifically about Rousseau and Hobbes. Is the whole enterprise of trying to define human nature absurd because there's so many individual variables? No. Uh, and it's not absurd either. But it's a hell of a lot more complicated than most of the people who seem to have, you know, glib theories about human nature uh, treat it as being. So it, it makes sense that some people would see it as absurd. You can generalize about human beings and practical matters and human nature without necessarily including every single human being. There's going to be some outliers. Like Aristotle says, everything in ethics, for example, is, um, you know, for the most part, meaning it, it applies in, in most cases. Their generality is not absolutely universal laws because that's that's we're that kind of complicated creature. Um, it doesn't mean that we can't generalize about human nature, but we have to be prepared to use all the resources that we, we have at our disposal. And those increase over time, right? Now we know more about, say, human beings and animals through uh, what zoologists have done. Um, and a lot of that has been enabled by, like, you know, video cameras, right? Um, engaging in observation of animal behavior. So, so that's, that's an important point. Now, about Rousseau and Hobbes, um, I like reading Hobbes, even though I disagree with him, because I think that Hobbes points out to us a fundamental danger um, inherent in, in society of, of a kind of social breakdown. And we, we want to avoid Hobbesian states. Um, so Hobbes is interesting, but Rousseau's got some other things on him. So Rousseau points out that Hobbes generalized about primitive human beings as if they were modern human beings, just, you know, remo you remove all their, their, their government and their technology and plunk them down on an island or something. He said, no, no, human, human nature develops over time and the passions develop over time. They become possible for us in a way that they weren't for our, you know, primitive hominid ancestors. Um, it's not just language that develops. It's not just metallurgy, agriculture, all this technology that's developed in social structure. It's the very passions of the human being. Rousseau also says that we have two other things that separate us from the other animals, and those are free will, as he understands it, and a capacity for self-improvement, which is very interesting. This is in the Discourse on the Origin of Inequality among Men, right? Um, so I, I think Rousseau's more on point. I'm not going to say I like totally endorse Rousseau's views on things, right? Um, but he's more right than Hobbes is. But Hobbes is right about where we could wind up, uh, especially in our, our contemporary situation. So I'm going to have to go. Um, thanks to everybody for joining me. I'll be doing another philosophy chat later on this week uh, before the end of the month. Um, same topic. I'll be doing that on Facebook Live instead of on YouTube Live. So you can find it on my, my Facebook page. Uh, didn't get to everybody's questions, but I got to quite a few. So, all right. Have a great evening. Those of you who are over here, some of you in other places, have a great morning, middle of the night, wherever you happen to be. And I'll see you the next time.